please. Thank you very much, Katya, for the invitation and the opportunity to give a talk at this wonderful, ser wonderful series of seminar. In particular, thank you for everything for for your organization during the last several years for this seminar series. As the title suggests, today I will tell a story about time-dependent coefficients on hyperbolic equations. I mean, about hyperbolic equations on Riemannian manifolds. Okay. Uh, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to do the single-page view for good note. I have to like scroll. Uh, my apologies. Yeah, but my talk will be. Uh, divided into three parts. First, I would like to quickly recall the tolerance problem, um, in particular, briefly go over their proof, um, which the audience um, might be very familiar with. And then I'll move on to mentioning our main results, which includes some geometric setting, as well as our boundary measurements in the inverse problems we're considering. And in the end, I will um, provide a sketch of the proof. So let me start with arguably the most um, fundamental and classic inverse, inverse problem called inverse conductivity problem, and also known as the Calden problem. So the statement of the problem says, suppose now we have a bounded domain in Rn with dimension greater than or equal to three, and that has a smooth boundary. And let's consider the conductivity equation in the domain omega, where the sigma is the unknown conductivity we are trying to re recover from boundary from some sort of a boundary measurement. And here the Dirichlet value is known to be a small function, a function f. So for, for now, let's assume this conductivity is moved up to the boundary and positive. So in Calderon's problem, the boundary measurement we're making is called this Dirichlet to Neumann map, which takes a possible Dirichlet value f to a Neumann data. In some practical setting, that's called the uh, current flux but that's the product of the electrical conductivity and the normal derivative of our, of our solution U measured at the boundary of the domain. And the column problem asks, does this Dirichlet Neumann map determine our conductivity sigma in the domain? And this question was answered by Sylvester Woman in 1987, where they show that suppose we suppose there are two C2 smooth up to the boundary conductivity, then the Dirichlet to Neumann map determines the conductivity uniquely in the in the whole domain. So in, in other words, they proved a uniqueness result. And now let me use one slide to briefly go over their proof, mainly serving as a motivation of uh, our proof, uh, which I will which I will talk about towards the uh, the later part of the talk. In, in the first step, they reduce the conductivity equation to a to a Schrodinger equation, which is also elliptic via the relation between Q, the uh, the potential in the Schrodinger equation, and the conductivity. And due to their uh, smooth smoothness assumption, this this potential Q is in, in is in the class L infinity. And the, and the second step, they derive the, the they derive the integral identity from the Dirichlet to Neumann map, and, the, and mainly from this derivation uses in the written by parts. And in particular, something I want to point out is that since they have measurements on the entire boundary of the domain, the right hand side is equal to zero. And let's see what we have in our integral identity later in the proof. And, and one more step is arguably the most important. They constructed a special solution called complex geometric optics, or and throughout this talk, I will refer to refer it as CGO solutions, where there's an exponential term, e to the x dot z to j divided by h, and there's a there's a constant one, and there's a remainder term. So in our proof, we shall also construct CGO solutions, but slightly different, as I'll mention later. And here, this z to j is a complex vector satisfying the following properties. So it, when it's, when we take the pro, the dot product of Theta is in itself, we get zero, and this norm is approximately equal to one. And also another property that the, the theta, this complex vector satisfies is that when we take the Laplacian of this exponential, notice that each time we take a derivative, we get one copy of this, of this complex vector theta. So if we take the Laplacian, we get we get zero. So we do have a harmonic function here, and this R 
there's a remainder term that will vanish in a suit bucket as h goes to zero. Once we have these serial solutions, we're ready to proceed further in the proof. Now, if we take any real vector um, psi in, in Rn, we are going to we're going to find any two. We're going to find two complex vectors, z to one, z to two, such that this equation is satisfied. The purpose for this is that we, we will be able to see a Fourier transform, which we will do by, I mean, after we we plug in these two CGO solutions into the integral identity, which I have in the previous slide. So after doing so, we see that we have these exponentials multiplied together that becomes the e to the i side dot x, that just some Fourier frequency we are going to have. And we have one plus some product of the remainder terms, which will vanish as our parameter h goes to zero. So if we take the limit, the only surviving term will be the q1 minus q2 times e to the i side dot x and in, in, the, in, the, in the integral. And that is nothing but the Fourier transform of q1 minus q2 at the frequency negative, I mean, minus that. So, we, and then we, they use the injectivity of Fourier transform to conclude q1 equals to q2 and pass it to, uh, I mean, sigma, sigma one equals to sigma two. So that's the, their proof for the Calder problem. Just a quick overview. And now let me move to our result. And first, let me introduce the setup of our problem. Throughout the talk, let's assume this. Let's assume mg to be a non smooth, compact oriented Riemannian manifold of dimension greater than n greater than or equal to three. So we're not in our inverse problems. We're considering we're not trying to recover this metric g. We we will assume that uh, the the metric is known, and we're interested in some. Um, coefficients in appearing in certain PDE. And also let me introduce a couple of notations. Let's denote Q to be the fit, to be the product of um, a, a time interval from zero to T, a finite time interval times the uh, interior of the manifold M. And let's also denote sigma to be the lateral boundary of our manifold, of our space-time cylinder. And here is the Q, Q is our space-time cylinder by the way. Okay. But the PD we're interested in considering is a hyperbolic PD with time dependent lower order terms. So we have a wave operator box G, which is given by C to the power negative one. Uh, this C in contrast, in contrast to some um, common notation, it's not the wave speed. I'll, I'll introduce C uh, officially in the next slide. So this, we have this box operator with a time dependent damping term, A times DT plus a potential Q. And this um, Laplacian G is the, is the well-known Be Laplace Beltrami operator. And one more property that C satisfies is, is a positive smooth function, okay? So, and the inverse problem we're trying to consider in this talk is we recovered these unknown time dependent functions, A and Q from in the whole space-time cylinder from some boundary measurements we're making. So still now we have two, at least two things to introduce. One is the boundary measurements, which I have not specified yet, and also the exact geometric setting. There's a very specific class of Riemannian manifold that I will be, that we're considering throughout this talk. And this class of manifold is what we call conformally, transversally, and isotropic, or throughout the time I'll refer to it as CTA. And this, this, this class of manifold satisfy the following. This, so our manifold, our CTA manifold, MG, is compactly Im embedded in, in the inter, in the product of a, of a Euclidean line and a, and the interior of another manifold called M0. And our Riemannian metric G, is conformal to this Riemannian to this um, metric e direct sum with g naught, and here this r with the Euclidean metric is, as we know, the Euclidean real line, and this transversal manifold equipped with the, the Riemannian metric g naught is what we call a transversal manifold. And here, let me briefly just point out that this transversal manifold is of dimension n minus four. 
and the C is a smooth function called the we, which we often refer as the conformal factor, and this is the same function as appear in the box operator. So this the function C appeared in the box op in the wave operator is indeed the conformal factor for the CTA manifold. So some examples of CTA manifold include compact subdomains in the Euclidean in the Euclidean space, or a unit sphere minus a point, or um, a hyperbolic space. There are more examples um, of, out there, but let me just mention these three. And also throughout this talk, for the sake of simplicity, let me assume this conformal factor C is equal to one. And in our uh, papers, which are our archive, we consider general C conformal factor. So now a question we want to address is why do we consider CTA manifolds instead of general Riemannian, general classes, classes of Riemannian manifolds? And that lies in the construction of the dual solution, which is which is also a truth of that in our proof. Okay. So in our proof, we will be constructing CGO solutions of the following form. Also, we have some exponential term with an amplitude plus some remainder term, which I will detail um, later when I, when I discuss the proof. But what I want to point out here is that this x1, which I will refer to it, which I call denote as phi, is something we call a limiting complement weight. Um, without mentioning all the technical details about limiting complement weight, let me only mentioning, let me only mention why, I mean, what's the importance of this, what's the importance of CTA manifold related to car, limiting complement weight. It was proved by the son of Valera, Kenny Sullivan Woman in 2009 that the existence of this limiting complement weight is more or less equivalent to the manifold having CTA structure. So we're considering this CTF structure because of the CGO solution we're constructing later in the proof. Okay. Now with the geometric setting introduced, let me mention what kind of boundary measurements we're making. Okay. And here we're also utilizing the limiting column weight, which allows us to define the front face and back face in, in the picture shown as U and V respectively, we can define the front face and back face using the limiting complement weight. And let's keep, let me denote, uh, you know, by the boundary M plus or minus, and let me denote the sigma plus minus as the time, in, the, the space, sort of the space, space time, the, the time interval times the respective front face or back face of this, of this manifold. Okay. And now let's, de let's define two neighborhoods of the sigma plus or plus minus, or one of them u, the other the other one of them b, and here this u prime and b prime what are neighborhoods of are neighborhoods of the this, this um, front face and back face of the manifold, d, dm plus and dm minus respectively. Okay. But what is important about these two sets u and v are the following: they are both approximately half of the lateral boundary, not exactly half but approximately half, and they do have a very small overlapping regions, and also their union is, is the entire lateral boundary. Okay. And with that, um, to, with the two open sets defined, let me introduce our partial cofinated set, which includes the derivative value me measured at the, the entire lateral boundary, at the, the initial surface t equal to zero, which is the bottom of the space time cylinder. And at the term, final time capital T, which is the top surface. And also we're measuring dt at the bottom surface and as well as the uh, normal derivative at this open set V on the metal boundary. So there are two reasons why we call this set a partial cosinated set. One is that if we look at the last component in our measurement, we are only taking the Neumann value at approximately half of the lateral boundary. Another reason is that for full Cauchy data set on each hypersurface, we need to have, excuse me, we need to have both the Dirichlet value and the Neumann value. And if we look at the top surface, we are, we are missing the Neumann value at the top surface, T equal to capital T. So, 
a full coach data that fetch should have six elements in their measurement. We have five, and also we are making Neumann data. We're measuring Neumann data on the mental boundary only in an open set. And here, of course, our, our U is our solution to the hyperbolic um, equation. And now let me introduce our inverse, the inverse problems that will be considered in this talk. So let's recall with the assumption that the conformal factor C equals to one, we have our wave of, we have our hyperbolic operator and we have our partial coefficient data set. Here in this talk, I'm going to introduce two results. First is recover is a unique recovery of both the damping coefficient and the potential from this partial coefficient data set I introduced earlier. And in the second problem, we're going to make like modifications in the Cauchy data set as well as the hyperbolic operator. In particular, we're letting go of this damping coefficient and only consider the potential Q and also some modifications we're making in the uh, Cauchy data is, so now if we look at the first element in our measurement, in the case that we're considering both damping coefficient and potential, we're measuring the duration rate data on the entire lateral boundary. But in the second problem, where we are only considering the potential, we are making, I mean, we're measuring the duration rate data, data only on, on an open set of the lateral boundary. In particular, we're measuring the duration rate value and Neumann value on opposite uh, on different open sets. And also compared to the first data where we make any we can make we make measurements at t equal to zero, we are we are imposing this condition that the initial the initial value of the wave is at zero. And also uh, the support, I mean I mean uh, our solution is supported in this open set U, which is the set we're measuring on over the, in the lateral boundary. And we see from these two, both of these two sets, um, a Cauchy data that it's a lot of data. And but then the natural question we want to ask is, can we let go of some of the data to to and to prove the same result? The answer is not quite in our context, where we are trying to recover time dependent coefficients. But if we want to recover, um, but if we want to recover time independent coefficients. It suffices to only have measurements made on the lateral boundary. Time independent coefficient, we don't need um, measurements made on the bottom surface and the top surface. Okay. The reason is due to finite speed of wave propagation. So if a wave has zero initial conditions, at, say at the initial time t equal to zero on the bottom surface, then due to finite speed of wave propagation, we cannot. I mean, this whole wave will be equal to zero in this whole in this whole cone, so we will not be able to measure the measure the wave. There will be some gauge. There will be some gauge obstacle to um, uniqueness due to this reason. And in the Euclidean setting, there are a lot of um, results, which also includes both uniqueness and stability. Um, for example, in in 1991, Rakesh and Ram, they settled with recovery of the potential in the in the whole space-time cylinder minus these two cones, which is often referred to as the optimal subset. And in particular, these two cones have 45 degree angles. And also, if we also in 1991, Ram and Schurstrand, they extended the space-time cylinder to an infinite time interval. So instead of from instead of zero to t time, a finite interval zero to t times m, they consider all real all possible time r times m, and they were able to recover uh, q uniquely on this infinite cylinder. And another approach that um, people have been taking, which is also the approach we are we are using, is to incorporate some measurements at the initial time and final time. And before I introduce our um, main results, there's one more thing I would like to mention. Uh, let's quickly recall that this, 
first by surveillance movement utilize the injectivity of the Fourier transform. And it's also the case that in many such problems, the, the proof comes down to sort of some comes down to some kind of proof. I mean, some kind of a um, transform, my apologies. And in our problem, in both of our problems, our problems were considering this attenuated geodesic ray transform. So in, uh, in addition to the geometric setting or assumption that our manifold is CTA has this CTA structure, we also assume the injectivity of the attenuated geodesic ray transform on the transversal manifold. Not the whole manifold MG, but only on the transversal manifold. Now let me introduce, or let me let's define what, a, what an attenuated geodesic ray transform is. That is, so now we have a smooth function alpha, which is often called, which is in this context referred to as um, the attenuation. Then our attenuated geodesic ray transform is given by this I alpha, where we're integrating this exponential, this attenuation first, and then take this to this exponent and integrate our function f about a geodesic. And the, the geodesic ray transform is a special case of attenuated geodesic ray transform with alpha equal to zero. So in that case, this exponential term, we don't have it. Then we have the usual geodesic ray transform, which we're, where we're integrating a function about a geodesic from zero to the x time. So in general, this attenuated geodesic ray transform is not injective on CTA manifolds. That's why we are assuming this. But if we impose more geometric settings or geometric assumptions, we do have injectivity results. For example, in 2009, Bill Santos, Alela, Kenny, Xavier, and Ullman, they proved that the injectivity, I mean, that the, the, the attenuated ray transform is injective on simple manifolds if we have a small attenuation. A simple manifold, there are, there are some technical definitions, but the catch for simple manifolds, I, I want to mention in this talk, is that um, geodesics on the simple manifold, they're distance minimizing, and they don't have, that uh, such manifolds don't have conjugate points, and geodesics do not self-intersect. And with, going beyond the setting of simple manifolds, a few years ago, Patton and Sago, Uman and Joe, they proved injectivities of attenuated, attenuated, attenuated rate transforms on um, manifolds of dimension higher than or equal to three with, with a, with foliation condition. And we can understand this foliation condition as like an onion, which we can peel from outside to inside. There's some, some examples satisfying the global foliation conditions include the torus and the more classic chasing as in the second and third bullet point. And these two also come from this 2019 paper by the four authors where they proved, so now suppose we have a non-negative sectional curvature, then manifolds with strict convex boundary will satisfy the global foliation condition. But if we have negative sectional curvature, then we need to add simple connectedness to for the manifold to have global foliation condition. Okay. But now I'm ready to introduce our um, main results, but first let me very quickly recall what the inverse problems we're considering. Now, we have two open sets, U and V, both are approximately half of the metal boundary. And when we have this damping term, we're making the Dirichlet measurement on the entire metal boundary. But if we let go of the um, damping term, we're making measurements on only approximately half of the boundary and Neumann data on the other half. And also in this second part where we don't have the damping term, we, we suppose that the initial value is equal to zero and also the support of our solution, I mean, our solution is supported in this measurement set on the metal boundary. Okay. So these two um, are our main results, which both of which are proved 
dash here. So in the first one, suppose now we have our we have two damping term, two damping coefficient that are in the class of W one infinity and and the potential is continuous up to the boundary. And also both the a one and a two q one q two they agree they agree on the on the on the entire boundary of the of the space time seven there then we were we proved that the Cauchy data implies uniqueness for both damping term and the potential. And the second problem, where we only considered the potential, we we were able to prove that under the assumption that our potentials agree on the boundary, the Cauchy data determines our the determines continuous potentials after the boundary uniquely in the whole space time cylinder. So we are not the first uh, group of authors considering such problems. Such problems were considered earlier in different geomet geometric setting. For example, in 2016, Yabar Tien, he can consider, uh, he, he proved uniqueness result for only the potential on Rn with the same set of Cauchy data and a finite space-time cylinder. And in 2019, Kian and Oxen, and they proved the same uniqueness, uniqueness result only considering the potential on CTA manifolds, but with simple transversal manifolds. And not. So our second result really extended both of the in 2016 result and in Oxen and result from simple geometric settings to general CT, class of CTA manifolds. And now, if we consider the damping term as well, Kian in 2017 proved that the Cauchy the Cauchy data determines um, determines both the damping term and the potential uniquely in the space time cylinder. On the, where I mean I mean uh, in the Euclidean setting. Let me use the remaining time to briefly go over a proof, but I think if before I continue, um, it would be a good time to pause for some questions if there are any. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, let me met, give a sketch of the proof. Both proofs come from the both proofs come from the same general idea. Uh, um, if we incorporate the damping term into consideration, the argument's a bit more technical. So um, in this part of the talk, let me introduce, let me mention, let me discuss the proof without the damping term to, to give the general idea of what we are doing. Okay. So first, similar to Sylvester and Woman's um, proof, we, we, have, we need to derive an integral identity from the assumption that the Cauchy data for two sets of coefficients agree. And here in particular, we do have some terms on the right hand side. That's because we are because our problem is the partial data case, where in Sylvester and Woman's case, they had the full data, so they don't really have much on the right hand side. Okay. And here our solution U1 is uh, is the one for the formal L2 adjoint operator for this first coefficient Q1 and our U2 solves our hyperbolic PD with coefficient, coefficient Q2. And V is a, is, a, is a solution to our hyperbolic operator with coefficient Q1. And our U is the difference of U2 and V. In particular, if we take difference of U2 and V, we see some vanishing conditions for these um, duration or Neumann values on different part of the boundary. And also the most important part in the proof is the, is the second part where we construct exponentially growing and decaying solutions. And where we also have this exponential part and, it, and the amplitude and here this amplitude is called the Gaussian beam quasi mode. This is because of our, of our geometric setting here we don't have um, simplicity assumption on the transversal manifold, which means our manifold could have um, conjugate points and geodesic could either self, could, could self intersect. So the global geometric optics solution, which was used by uh, Kian and the results by Kian and the, the, one, the one by Kian and Oxen and are not really applicable to us. And here are 
expo exponential growing solution also has an exponential part and the same Gaussian beam quasi mode. And here in particular, due to the assumption in our Cauchy data that we have zero initial condition for U2 and also U2 is supported in U on the lateral boundary, our solution U2 needs to satisfy these two conditions. And, and by the way, here F is a uh, complex operator, I mean a complex number. And our so remainders R1 and R2, there are correction terms that vanish in a suitable sense, albeit a little bit different as we shall, we shall see uh, momentarily when H goes to zero. And another important component in our proof is the column and estimate. It serves two purposes. First, we need this to control the terms appearing on the right-hand side of the integral identity. And also we need column and estimates to show the existence and a rate of decay for our remainder term R1 in the exponentially decaying solution with respect to H1 semi-classical norm. Now, let me discuss briefly about the Gaussian beam quasi modes. The, the, the way we approach this is we are, we are considering, we're, we're constructing Gaussian beam quasi modes locally in the neighborhood of the geodesic and then use scaling arguments to patch things together. So, our local setting is the following Q is, as usual, our space time cylinder. M has this um, product structure as well. And we can so we can write the local coordinate as the time variable t, this um, Euclidean direction in the CTA manifold x1, and the ver the variable or the, the point living on the transversal manifold as n naught. And let's call our geodesic gamma to be a non-tangential one on the transversal manifold n naught. And associated to that, we introduce some Fermi coordinates tau y, where tau is our travel time, on for, I mean, for the geodesic, and y is the direction or orthogonal to the speed of the geodesic. In particular, near the geodesic, our um, metric on the on the transversal manifold can be expressed in this way. So our goal to construct Gaussian beam quasi modes is constructed first locally along the geodesic, or in the neighborhood of the geodesic gamma, and then use a Galilean argument to patch things together. To that end, we first can compute this conjugated operator and with this Gaussian beam onset and, and in direct computation, we see we have, we have, we see that to construct the Gaussian beam quasi mode, we need to find a solution to this um, blue equation, which was, which we call Iconal equation. So we, we find theta and also we find just a solution to the transport equation B so that we have our Gaussian beam quasi mode. Okay. And also we need to show that for future for later purposes, our Gaussian beam quasi mode satisfying the estimate is L is L2, the Gaussian beam, the L2 norm for the Gaussian beam quasi mode on the transport of manifold is a order capital of one. And and these two up these two L2 estimates um, for, the, for the conjugated operators, one for exponentially growing, a uh, uh, decaying part, one for exponentially growing. And one more um, property that we we need for this Gaussian beam quasi mode is something called concentration property. In the first, in the beginning, we constructed Gaussian beam quasi modes locally in a small neighborhood of the geodesic, but we, we showed that as H goes to zero, indeed, the Gaussian beam quasi modes will converge to a, this integral, which involves the Gaussian beam quasi will, will converge to an integral along the geodetic. This is how we are going to be able to extract uh, the geodetic or, or the attenuated geodetic ray transform in our proof. And here I want to point out one thing re related to our um, regularity assumption for the potential. So in the Euclidean setting, which was considered by Kian or Kian and Oxen, they were able to prove uniqueness results for L infinity um, potential Q. 
But in our case, we were we were able to only consider uh, continuous potentials up to the boundary, and that's that's because of this theorem. This concentration property needs continuity. Um, this needs con continuous functions to be valid, which makes our whole proof valid. So that's the that's the bottleneck of the, the the whole proof in in terms of the regularity. I also want to mention that if one wants to prove uniqueness result for um, less than continuous, less than continuous um, potentials, it's likely that our our whole proof will not, our, our method will not quite work in that case. Okay. okay, something else in the CGL solution we are trying to, con we need to construct is the remainder term. First, let's consider this exponentially decaying part. Do you want? To the equate to the to the L2 joint of the conjugated operator. So it follows from direct computation that if we want to find R1, it suffices to find find a so find a remainder R1 satisfying this conjugated operator equation. And this, and in that regard, we were able to prove a solvability result, which shows suppose we have any uh, function f or any L2 function f. Then we have a remainder term in the space H in the semi classical H1, H1 space, such that this equation is satisfied, and we have a norm, we have an estimate in the H1 semi classical norm for R. And in our particular case, our F is this right hand side of the conjugated operator equation. Whose whose L two estimate we, we proved when we were constructing the Gaussian beam quasi mode that is capital O of H to the three half. So if we put put this estimate into this inequality in, in, into this inequality in the theorem, we see immediately that our first remainder R one its norm its H one semi classical norm is in the order capital O of H to the one half as H goes to zero. So the, in the previous case, in the previous solution exponentially decaying one, we didn't have any boundary risk boundary conditions imposed on the solution. So we were able to use a tool called interior column estimate, which requires us to expand the, dom the domain or manifold a little bit to get uh, desired properties for our remainder. But in this in this exponentially decaying I mean, uh, exponentially growing solution U2, due to the boundary assumption that U2 is equal to zero at the initial time, and also it, it is supported in the in an open set of the mental boundary, we cannot use the interior carbon estimates anymore because expanding the domain will cost us precisely these two pieces of information. We no longer have control over, over those. So, to medicate this this issue, we we're we're using a different we're using a slightly different approach, which was initially used by Ken and Oxen in their paper, where they showed uniqueness result on for the potential on CTA manifold with simple transversal manifold, and in their proof, they they, they showed the existence of U two in particular this remainder R two, whose L two norm estimate is a big F is of order big O of H to the one half as H goes to zero. So in our in our paper we we wrote a different proof for the same result. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients we needed to proceed in the proof. First, once we have the CGO solutions. Let's plug them into the integrality and take the limit h goes to zero. So we see from from the carbon from the boundary carbon estimates, which proved in our in our papers that the right hand side of this integrality, both terms are of order capital O h to the one half, and to the left hand side, once we plug the CGO solutions into the integrality, anything that is multiplied with the remainder will have order big O of H to the one half due to the um, 
estimates we put earlier in the for the remainders. And the, the remaining term would be this, this integral. So as h goes to zero, so as we take the limit, h goes to zero, the right hand side will vanish. And also this term will will vanish as well. So the, the surviving term will only be this integral and that's equal to zero. Okay. And this is a at this point we're ready to use our uh, concentration property and then show that the attenuated geodesic ray transform of a Fourier of the Fourier transform of our difference in the potential Q1 minus Q2 vanishes. I mean, I mean as equal to zero. And then if by the injectivity injectivity assumption for the attenuated geodesic ray transform, we see that the Fourier transform of Q in these two Euclidean variables, in particular T and X1, that's the two Euclidean variables we had for the phase time cylinder. One comes from the time, the other comes from the Euclidean direction for the Riemannian manifold. So this Fourier transform vanishes, then we, in the, in the end, we are able to use the injectivity of Fourier transform to conclude that our potentials agree with each other in the whole space time cylinder. And that's how, and this is how our um, proof for this for the second main result goes. But as I mentioned, if we incorporate the incorporate the um, damping term, we still follow the same idea. But the the arguments, in particular, the Gaussian beam quasi mode construction, is a bit more uh, technical and involves more computation. So in this direction, we have some open. We still have some open problems. First. Um, we would like to consider unique recovery of both damping term and potential from this re really like full partial data, which is the same in the same spirit as our second result, where we only make we only measure the duration of the value on on an on an open set of of the metal boundary. In our result, we, we our result was from this. Um, Dirichlet result, Dirichlet value me measured on the whole metal boundary. We would like to improve this to part of the metal boundary. And also another, um, some other problems we could consider is recovering time dependent first order vector field potential from boundary measurements. Similar to the to elliptic operators such as magnetic Schrodinger, we will also see a gauge invariance from in our boundary measurements. So the best we could hope to do for this vector field potential is to recover it to, up to a gauge. There are some progress that's made to address this problem. Uh, in 2022 authors, they considered, they, sh they showed a, they showed a uniqueness, result, uniqueness result from partial data, which is of the similar spirit as our uh, damping result on in the Euclidean set but not so much so far the, this problem on the um, Romanian medical settings still, to my best knowledge, open. And tw in 2021, four authors, Fez Mohammadi, Ilma Verda, Ken, and Oxton, and they, they were able to recover a time dependent first order, first order term and the potential in a in a compact Romanian manifold with injective geodesic ray transform from the, only the partial data. So earlier in this talk, we mentioned that if we only have metal boundary data, the best we could do is recovering recovering the potential up to, in this case, up to a gauge in this whole space time cylinder minus the, the two cones. But uh, their result, in their result, they were able to recover only these potentials in the subset of the whole space time cylinder minus the two cone. So there are some uh, there are some um, open problems in this direction as well. And also uh, there are some open problems related to stability result, both time independent case and time dependent case. Um, for time dependent case, this problem is fairly well understood in RM, but um, one important tool used was this called the Fourier slicing theorem, which is not quite available on manifolds. And that is probably 
a big reason why the stability result for time dependent coefficients is still not quite well understood in the Riemannian manifold standard. But for time independent coefficients, there are quite a few results available. Okay. Yeah. So I know we, I didn't get into too much technical details. Um, however, if, if any, but in any person in the audience is interested in checking out the technical details, um, we have the, the two papers are po were posted on archive at some point last year. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Boa, for the very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free Hello. to... Please. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah ma'am, I have a question. So in the theorem, you have assumed that A1 is A1 on the boundary assumption, equality of boundary assumption. Yeah. So where you have used that in the proof? Oh yeah, we yeah we, this... we assume this because we I mean because in, if with this assumption we don't have to do boundary determination. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't have to, I mean, if, we, if we don't have this this assumption, then I think one needs to do uh, boundary determination from the from the data. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments, please? If not, thank you very much, Boya, for the very nice talk once again. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, much everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.